Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Epic History TV, new video, my favorite channel on YouTube. This is going to be an experience. Now more than ever, if you're not ready to learn, get out. You don't deserve this channel, all right? Uh, if you're new to the channel, hello, my name is Connor. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. The original link to the video is at the top of the description below. Right below that is a link to the Discord. Just click on that. It'll send you right over there. Join the family. Help create the atmosphere I want to create around history on YouTube and Discord. All that good stuff. Pull up a chair. I'd love to have you more the merrier. Makes it easier for me to interact with you guys. Okay. NC recommendations. Let's do it. Salamis 40 BC. Battle for Greece. Technical difficulty check. We're good. Let's do it. In the 5th century BC, the great king of Persia ruled the greatest empire the world had ever seen. It stretched from modern Pakistan to Macedonia and contained one-fifth of the world's population. The Persian Empire was sophisticated. One fifth. I guess. I was just thinking, like, what about, you know, China? Okay, it sorry. Rich. Pausing Population. too early. A lot. The Persian Empire was sophisticated, rich, and all conquering. And in 480 BC, King Xerxes led its mighty forces against Greece, a patchwork of tiny city states that lay on the western fringes of his vast realm. He had decided to punish the Greeks for having dared to meddle in his affairs. But seeking vengeance, conquest, and glory, he would find only disaster and death in the Straits of Salamis. This video is sponsored by Historic Mail, a unique it. offering and perfect gift for any history lover. Historic Mail has revived. If you want to skip the ad, fine. I've come to the decision to play ads now just because it's their material. I'm able to react to it. Least I can do. If you want, just click the forward arrow. Saved the lost art of letter writing. Sign up, and each week in the mail, you'll receive a faithful reproduction of a letter written by a famous historical figure, such as Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Edison, or even Queen Victoria. You'll also receive a typed transcript of the letter, plus a document explaining its historical context. Historic Mail's brilliant idea is to offer insight into the lives of great historical characters. Any of you who are watching, hope you're doing well. Primary source can, with the added pleasure of a tangible historical document arriving on your doorstep. Their letter packs cover various themes. Pick the American history option and you'll receive mail from characters such as George Washington, Abe Lincoln, Mark Twain, and others. Other themes include World War II, leaders and their lovers, and the life of Winston Churchill. Along the way, you'll get intimate insight into the lives of iconic figures, such as this example, in which Queen Victoria consoles Mrs. Mary Todd Lincoln following the president's assassination. Historic wow. Mail makes an ideal gift for any history lover, with a certificate you can share with your favorite person to reveal their surprise gift. Visit historicmail.com slash epic and use the code EPIC10 for an exclusive 10% discount on any product. Thanks again to Historic Mail for sponsoring this video. Go kill. Let's do it. The Historiae of Herodotus of Halicarnassus is presented here so that the great and marvelous deeds of Greeks and barbarians should not go unsung. I just say, imagine just all of the history that is not was not written down, nobody's going to know about, and you know a lot of the, uh, I don't, later in the video I might go into it. Too early to pause. The events that follow are known chiefly from the writings of Herodotus of Halicarnassus, an ancient Greek colony on what's now the west coast of Turkey. About 30 years after the Persian invasion, Herodotus began his historiae, his inquiries into its origins and course. Like most people in the ancient world, he believed in omens, oracles, and divine intervention. 
but he also believed that humans could shape their own fate. So he traveled across Greece and the Persian Empire, reading records and inscriptions, speaking to local people, and weighing up the evidence according to his own reason. The Roman writer Cicero would later dub Herodotus the father of history. War is the father and king of all. Some he has made gods and some men, some slaves and some free. The root of the conflict between Greece and Persia went back a generation. In the 6th century BC, King Cyrus the Great brought the Greek colonies of Western Anatolia under Persian rule. But in 499, they rebelled and appealed to their fellow Greeks for aid. Only Athens and Eritrea answered the call. Together, the Greeks burned the provincial capital Sardis and its temple to the earth goddess Sibylle. It seemed like a major victory, but the Persians responded with impressive speed, and the Greeks were soon in full retreat back to the coast. It took the Persians four years to finally stamp out the revolt in Western Anatolia. Then the great king Darius turned his attention to the Greeks across the sea, who dared to aid the rebels. Sparta? He sent ambassadors to the many city-states of Greece, demanding earth and water as tokens of submission. Many submitted. So that's pretty much like when they're sending these people, it's it's like a nice way of saying, like, here's a bunch of gifts and stuff, but it's like, accept them or we're going to come invade you. So it's like, hey, accept your rule out, your rule under us, or we're going to invade you. But two did not. Athens, a young democracy, fiercely Sparta. protective of its liberty. And Sparta, a conservative, militarized state that took orders from no one. Both I watched cities, 300. I know everything there is to know about Sparta. Answered the great king by kicking his envoys down a well, where they were told they might find all the earth and water they required. I swear to God, if one of you guys didn't get my sarcasm and ends up in the 300... All right. BC, Darius... In 490 BC, Darius dispatched a mighty expedition to bring the Greeks to heel. Naxos was the largest of several islands to submit. Eritrea was sacked and burned. Then the Persians landed at Marathon to mete out the same punishment to Athens. Athenian troops, with those of their small neighbor Plataea, met them on the beach. Though outnumbered two to one, the Greek soldiers attacked. Their hoplite infantry fought with large, heavy shields and spears in a tight phalanx formation. The more lightly equipped Persians could not stand up to their onslaught. Persian troops were slaughtered on the beach. The survivors scrambled back to their ships. Athens had been saved. So I just want to ask, so when you're going to battle like this, on a large scale, like right here. Maybe if I go a little bit. So on either side, I'm sure they know, even if they're not a veteran in a, in a different war, if you're on the front line, you're going to die. Like there's no way you're going to live even if your, uh, your side is, is victorious because it seems like the game here is when, when two giant lines of formations of armies meet each other that... It's obviously the front line, the front front lines smash into each other, and it's a game of, of block and stab and just trying to kill. And when your opponents uh, die in front of you, they're going to be replaced. You kill them. And when you die, you are people behind you. And so if you're marching and in, you're in like the first three rows, I don't care if you're on the victorious side or not, you're going to die, it seems. Hoplite infantry fought with large, heavy shields and spears in a tight phalanx formation. The more lightly equipped... And, sorry, just it gets to a point where either one side runs out of men because you killed them all, or you rout them. 
explosions and spears in a tight phalanx formation. The more lightly equipped Persians could not stand up to their onslaught. Persian troops were slaughtered on the beach. The survivors scrambled back to their ships. Athens had been saved. Four years later, Darius died and was succeeded by his son Xerxes. He now took up the task of punishing the Greeks and avenging his so father's Xerxes humiliation. Xerxes is the son of Darius. Avenging the Greeks and avenging his father's humiliation. Sorry, I have task to go back. Of punishing there. the Greeks and avenging his father's humiliation. The new king of kings summoned troops and ships from across his empire and ordered a bridge of boats to be built across the Hellespont. In spring 480 BC, his gigantic invasion force crossed from Asia into Europe. Herodotus estimated its size at 2.3 million men, an impossible number that could not... What? That's like World War II number. That's like Operation Barbarossa number. Well, they had like 3 million. Or watered. Modern historians think 200,000 more likely, still vast for the age. It was accompanied by an enormous fleet, a thousand warships or more, supplied by Persia's vassal states across the eastern Mediterranean. Greece appeared an easy target. Its many independent city-states were notorious for constant infighting. But in the face of the Persian threat, 31 states put aside their differences. That means they're also going to be very battle-hardened if they're fighting each other. And convened a council of war at the Isthmus of Corinth to plan the defense of Greece. These states were later commemorated on a giant serpent column at Delphi, the Greeks' most sacred site. At the top of the list, the Lacedaemonians, another name for the Spartans, followed by the Athenians and Corinthians. Sorry. The Greeks' most sacred site. At the top of the list, the Lacedaemonians, another name for the Spartans, followed by the Athenians and Corinthians. Knowing the Persians would invade from the north, the Greeks sent 10,000 men to hold a mountain pass at Tempe, near Mount Olympus. But when the troops arrived, they found the position could be easily outflanked. Nor were they confident about the loyalty of Thessaly to their rear. So the troops withdrew. Instead, the Greeks would make their stand at Thermopylae, with 7,000 men led by the Spartan king Leonidas. The Greek fleet arrived at Artemisium to guard the sea flank. Like the alliance itself, the Greek fleet was an uneasy coalition, with ships from city-states like Athens and Aegina that had until recently been at war. The Athenian contingent was by far the largest. It only existed thanks to the discovery, three years earlier, of rich silver mines at Laurium. It had taken the foresight of Themistocles, an Athenian statesman and general, to persuade the people of Athens not to spend this windfall on cash handouts for themselves. Instead, he'd urged them to spend the money on a fleet of 200 triremes for their own future security. It was a decision that may ultimately have saved Greece. Athens, however, was so distrusted by other Greeks that they refused to serve under an Athenian admiral. So Themistocles tactfully accepted the appointment of a Spartan, Eurybiades, to lead the fleet, even though Spartans had no expertise in naval warfare. Spray flying from the oars, the fleets sweep together, plowing through the swell. That's such a cool visual. Spraying, spray flying from the oars. Ram teeth bared. Both the Greek and Persian fleets relied on a single type of warship, one that dominated naval warfare in the Mediterranean, the trireme. 
Sleek, agile, and delicate, the Trireme. I like this. Give me a history of ships. Naval warfare in the Mediterranean, the Trireme. Sleek, agile, and delicate, the Trireme carried masts and sails for cruising. But in combat, these were lowered, and the ship relied on three banks of rowers, which gave the trireme its name. So they didn't row and use wind the at the same time. The ship carried 170 oarsmen in total, who could produce a top speed of around 10. No, I'm stupid. Sorry, that must have been be so that their masts don't get destroyed. Trireme or its name. Three row. The ship carried 170 oarsmen in total, who could produce a top speed of around 10 knots to smash their primary weapon, a bronze-sheathed ram. That's way faster than I thought. Into the hull of an enemy ship, leaving it crippled. Boarding the enemy was another tactic. A Greek ship usually carried 14 marines, 10 hoplites armed with spear and shield, and four archers. The ship's commander, the Triarch, sat at the stern. Alongside the helmsman, the Kybernetes, who guided the ship's course with twin rudders. I love you, Epic History TV. Helmsman, the Kybernetes, who guided the ship's course with twin rudders. A bosun and bow officer relayed orders to the oarsmen, while a piper helped them keep time. A carpenter and ten sailors brought the ship's total complement to 200 men. Every ship had a name. And a painted eye on the bow to avert ill fortune. Herodotus describes the Greek ships as more heavily built than the Persian ships, although in what way, we're not sure. He also tells us that Persian ships carried... Sorry, I, was, I missed that because I'm noticing the sails are not very full of wind right now. ...the Greek ships as more heavily built than the Persian ships, although in what way, we're not sure. He also tells us that Persian ships carried many more marines, 44 in total. Here, the sons of Athens set in place the bright foundation stone of freedom. While Leonidas and the Greeks held the pass at Thermopylae, the bright foundation stone of freedom. While Leonidas and the Greeks held the pass at Thermopylae, the Persian fleet sailed south along the rugged coastline of Magnesia. But one night, while at anchor, they were hit by a violent storm. Hundreds of ships were wrecked and damaged. Thousands of sailors drowned. According to Herodotus, the Persians further weakened their force by sending 200 triremes around the island of Euboea to cut off the Greek retreat. But the entire squadron was destroyed by another storm. Okay. Uh I was, I'm saying it seems like a long way, but just to block them from getting out that way, that makes sense, but the storm. Herodotus offers little supporting evidence for this operation, which would have been extremely reckless, and some historians doubt it ever happened. Despite Persian losses, the Greeks still faced odds of nearly three to one at Artemisium. And they weren't just outnumbered. The Persian fleet was more experienced in naval warfare, particularly the elite squadron from Phoenicia in modern Lebanon. It looked like that it might have better boats. Nevertheless, over three days what did they say about Lebanon on naval I... warfare, particularly the elite squadron from Phoenicia in modern Lebanon. Stop pausing. Nevertheless, over three days of tense naval combat, the Greek fleet held its nerve and kept the Persians at bay. But at the end of the third day, disastrous news arrived. Leonidas and the Greeks at Thermopylae had been encircled. The Spartan king and half his men had been killed. The pass had fallen. It seemed the efforts of the Greek fleet had been in vain. Central Greece and Athens itself 
now lay open to the Persian onslaught. As the Greek fleet withdrew, the Persians marched south, burning cities, farms, and sanctuaries, though sparing Thebes, one of several Greek city-states to side with Persia. To Athenian dismay, the Greek army, dominated by troops from the Peloponnese, gathered at the Isthmus of Corinth and began building a great wall to protect their own homes from the invader. Athens was to be abandoned. The Greek fleet began to evacuate civilians to Trezin, Aegina, and Salamis. Pallas Athena cannot appease Olympian Zeus, but the wooden wall alone, the wooden wall shall stand. In the months before the Persian invasion, the Athenians had sent a delegation to the Greeks' holiest shrine, the Oracle of Delphi, seeking guidance for the upcoming war. They'd received only a terrifying warning. Why are you sitting there, you fools? Flee, flee to the ends of the earth. But a second oracle offered the Athenians a sliver of hope. Athens could trust in its wooden wall. Wait, so they just, they have a person. I gotta learn more about what these oracles are, but they just like say what they're thinking. They're like, yeah, you're screwed, or yeah, you're, I get it, it's a much more superstitious time, but it just. I... To the ends of the earth. But a second oracle offered the Athenians a sliver of hope. Athens could trust in its wooden wall. A few Athenians thought the oracle referred to a thorn hedge that had once enclosed the city's Acropolis, its citadel. So they fortified themselves there. But when the Persians arrived, they were surrounded and slaughtered. Xerxes then burned Athens and its temples to avenge the destruction of Sardis 18 years before. Themistocles argued that Athens' wooden wall was her new fleet. But as Greek naval commanders met at Salamis in mid-September, the situation looked grim. A king of Sp I love how these these predictions like uh, like stuff with like Nostradamus and, and stuff like that and oracles here. I get, you know, if you try and put yourselves in a time like this, it's almost impossible. But you don't know what the earth is. You don't know what you don't know what's out there and everything. And so it's much more easily believable in these oracles or stuff like that. But I love how like they never like question if the oracle is just wrong. It's always just like, well, they must have meant the wall of wooden ships or they must have meant this temple and and they go to that temple they get slaughtered and nobody thinks otherwise it's just like all right the oracle had to be right therefore it's just what were they talking about and i fascinated in mid-september the situation looked grim a king of sparta was dead athens was burning the greek alliance was on the brink of collapse Themistocles was desperate to stop the Peloponnesian ships retreating to the Isthmus. He warned them that the enemy's greater numbers and faster ships meant the Greeks would be defeated if they fought on the open sea. But in the narrow straits of Salamis... Well, I don't know why people were retreating to Aegina right there, I mean... With less room to maneuver, the Persians wouldn't be able to exploit their greater numbers, and the heavier Greek ships had the advantage. Hold on. With less room to maneuver, okay. the Persians were the advantage. Themistocles even warned the other Greeks that if they retreated now, the Athenian ships would quit the alliance and sail to Italy. So the fleet commander, Eurybiades, accepted Themistocles' plan. But Themistocles worried that the Peloponnesians would change their minds. Secretly, he ordered a trusted servant to go to the Persian camp to tell Xerxes that the Greeks were in a state of terror and would flee at first light. Just eight miles away at Phaleron, the great king sought the counsel of his generals and admirals. 
all advised him to attack the Greeks immediately to win the final victory that would end the war. All except Queen Artemisia of Halicarnassus, commanding five ships from Caria. Why risk battle, she argued, when the great king had only to threaten southern Greece by land or sea, and the Peloponnesians would rush home to defend their land, and the Greek alliance would split. Then victory was certain. But Xerxes sought the glory of battle, and was confident of an easy victory. Then Themistocles' messenger arrived, telling the king exactly what he wanted to hear. The Greeks were terrified and preparing to flee. He must strike immediately. Xerxes ordered the Persian fleet to sea that night, so they would be in position to annihilate the Greeks as they tried to escape at dawn. Meanwhile, at the Greek camp, an Athenian named Aristides arrived with sacred relics from Aegina to inspire the fleet. He also brought news that the enemy had put to sea and blocked the straits. Themistocles' ruse had worked. Retreat was no longer an option. The Greeks would have to fight at Salamis. Oh, divine Salamis, you will be the death of mother's sons. You don't have to be an oracle to accounts of the battle that followed by Herodotus and the Athenian playwright Aeschylus are sometimes vague and allow different interpretations. Let's do it! But they are detailed enough to allow us to reconstruct the most likely course of events. The Persian fleet put to sea at night, around 600 triremes, outnumbering the Greeks three to two. Expecting hard fighting at the entrance to the strait, they landed 400 soldiers on the tiny island of Sitalia. Their role was to finish off any shipwrecked Greeks who made it to shore. Then, keeping close to the mainland, the Persian fleet silently advanced into the narrow strait, the elite Phoenicians leading the way. According to a later Greek historian, Diodorus Siculus, the Persians also sent an Egyptian squadron around Salamis to cut off any Greek escape into the Gulf of Megara. But this event is not mentioned in earlier sources and may be an invention. At dawn, Xerxes arrived at an observation post overlooking the strait. The great king was confident. I just want to say I really like when, you know, they he does and people point out where you know, this is a very long time ago. We are piecing together history as well as we can, and they're very forth worth where, um, you know, this could or could not be true. Completely understandable with, you know, hundreds of years prior to AD. Just, I like that. At dawn, Xerxes arrived at an observation post overlooking the strait. The great king was confident that his presence would inspire his captains to fight with more determination than they'd shown at Artemisium a few weeks before. He was accompanied by scribes, ready to note down the names of captains who fought well, and those who did not. I was about to say that. The Persian fleet lined the northern side of the strait, ready to hunt down Greek ships as they fled. What they saw instead was 368 Greek triremes emerging from the bays of Salamis, ready to fight. They formed a line of battle with the best squadrons on each flank. On the left, the Athenians. On the right, the Agonetans. As they rode, they sang paeans, Greek hymns of battle. At first, they Let's held go, formation. Boys perhaps waiting for the morning breeze to blow at their back, or for more Persians to crowd into the strait. Then a Greek ship saw an opening and attacked. So I'm assuming, I don't know if that was a maneuver or not, but right, then a right there, maybe a little bit prior, you would build up speed and you're going kind of parallel to an oncoming enemy ship and then you just have all of the left rowers stop and all of the right this i'm not sure what starboard or the right side of the ship go 
keep going and then just turn and ram into the side. Greek ships saw an opening and attacked. Soon, both fleets were fully engaged. The battle became a chaotic mass of ships, wheeling, weaving, looking for a chance to ram an enemy and avoid the same fate themselves. In the narrow strait, the Persian squadrons became increasingly disordered. Any ship trying to fall back ran into other ships trying to press forward, their captains eager to impress the great king. Look at me, look at me. What's more, the Persian oarsmen had been rowing all night and soon began to tire. The Greeks were fresh and fighting for their freedom. The Phoenician squadron suffered heavy losses at the hands of the heavy Greek triremes. Some Phoenician captains, who'd abandoned their ships and made it to shore, were brought before Xerxes. They blamed the unfolding disaster on the cowardice of their allies, the Carians and Ionians. Just at that moment, Xerxes saw an Ionian ship ram an Athenian trireme, before it was rammed in turn by an Aegean ship. Undaunted, the Ionian marines counterattacked, boarding and taking the Aegean ship. After observing this evidence of Ionian bravery, Xerxes ordered that the Phoenician captains be taken away and executed. Wrecked. Sir, it wasn't me, it was all their fault. Well, I'm looking behind you, they're doing a really good job, so uh, take them away, boys. Ships taken away and executed. Wrecked ships, floundering men and corpses clogged the strait, as the battle turned decisively against the Persians. Aeschylus, the playwright, who almost certainly fought in the battle, compared the Greeks killing Persians to fishermen spearing tuna. As Persian ships tried to escape, they were hit in the flank by the Aegonetans, who distinguished themselves above all other Greeks that day. Queen Artemisia was among those trying to escape the slaughter, with an Athenian trireme in hot pursuit. Seeing her path blocked by a friendly ship, she gave the order to ram it. When the Athenian captain saw this, he thought he must be pursuing an allied ship, and went looking for other prey. The remnants of the... So by chance, because she rammed her own ship, because it was in her way, he is like, oh, well, that can't be a good ship. But if he kept going, he would have captured a very important... The Persian fleet streamed back. The remnants of the Persian fleet streamed back to Phaleron. In a final ruthless act of the battle, Aristides landed with a force of hoplites on Citalia and massacred the 400 Persians who'd been abandoned there. In total, the Persians lost around 200 ships and 12,000 men, including the fleet commander, Ariabignes, the be like brother of the great too, king himself. Man. The Greeks lost just 40 ships and men, including the fleet commander, Ariabignes, a half-brother of the great king himself. The Greeks lost just 40 ships. It proved to be one of the greatest naval victories in history. Our land bewails the men she bore slaughtered for Xerxes, who has fed hell's hungry jaws with Persian dead. The Greeks had inflicted a humiliating defeat on Xerxes and ended all hopes of an easy conquest. Now the king heeded Queen Artemisia's advice and ordered his general Mardonius to continue the campaign in spring, while he returned to Asia with the bulk of his army. If Mardonius was victorious, Artemisia had told him, the glory would belong to Xerxes. If Mardonius was defeated, the blame belonged to Mardonius. But there was no Imagine victory that. for Mardonius. 
The next summer, he faced the combined Greek army at Plataea. In a crushing Persian defeat, Mardonius was killed, along with much of his army. On the very same day, according to Herodotus, the Greek fleet inflicted another heavy defeat on the Persians at Mycale. The threat of Persian invasion was over. In the years that followed, the Greek counterattack would begin, led by a new Greek alliance, the Delian League. Salamis has been credited with more significance than almost any other battle in history. The victory that saved Greece from slavery and paved the way for its classical age. This was the period in which the arts, democracy, science, and philosophy flourished in- Wow. So good point. He, the narrator said, you know, one of the most in, um, important battles in history. And I'm like, well, but then, it's, you know, had this not been, you know, all of the things that so many cultures today, Western, I guess, civilization today, has a lot of its um, core ideologies from this period, and so that might not have happened had uh, they lost. So the Greek world, democracy, science, and philosophy flourished in the Greek world. Thus, Salamis has been hailed as the battle that saved the cradle of Western civilization. It's a dramatic argument that can be overstated. Greek defeat would not necessarily have led to the extinction of Greek culture. Right, that is assuming that, you know, who's to say Persia wouldn't fall, you know, a little bit later if they took Greece, or who's to say they would have kept pushing. Obviously, all the what-ifs, but uh, it's a cool idea. And though 5th century Athens was a revolutionary, pioneering experiment in democracy, it's not the sole blueprint on which modern democracy is based. Nevertheless, Salamis remains a decisive battle and a turning point of history. And thanks to Herodotus, it survives as one of history's Shout oldest out. examples of a heroic struggle against the odds and struggle for freedom. We have many people to thank for their help in making this video. Awesome video, Epic History TV, awesome. Shout out to Herodotus, father of history. Just, ah, uh, oh, great video. Awesome video. Um, I hope they come out with another one soon. I'm gonna get into uh, some of the other unfinished series on kings and generals, the uh, um, uh, Thirty Years' War and the Roman Civil War. Awesome channel. I'll be back with another one soon. Hit all the buttons. See you guys.